Welcome everyone to another series of our Global Employability Expert Webinar. So my name is Mirta Aguirre, I'm the Head of Employability of Virtual Internships. And before we jump up into our webinar, let me remind you how it works, okay? So first of all, we are recording this session, so you can watch it again uh, and share it with other people if you found the content, the, the content really interesting. Remember, we have a YouTube channel, you can subscribe uh, to our YouTube channel and then you will receive all our webinars and you can watch our previous ones. Um, you can make questions during your um, your, during our speaker presentation. You have a Q&A section below. Please um, write your questions there. And by the end of the uh, webinar, before we end, when the speaker has already presented, then we can ask all these very interesting questions. If you have any question about your program, please reach out to your IEM and they will be able to help you. So let's explore uh, the topic for today. Very interesting and useful topic. And the topic is how to boost your confidence for a work presentation. And for this very interesting and important topic, we have a great speaker for the day, which is Vanessa Catterford. Okay, so let me share a little bit about Vanessa. So Vanessa has worked as a reporter and presenter for some of the best known news organizations, including BBC, ITN, Reuters, and NBC. In 2018, she set up her company, Present, Perform, Persuade. Since then, she has helped hundreds of professionals to speak confidently and persuasively so they can advance their careers. And so in today's presentation, um, she will share a little bit about what she's learned. For many years, Vanessa worked as a news anchor and she was very, very successful. However, she struggled with public speaking nerves, which she learned to overcome. In this webinar, she will tell us why speaking nerves are natural, it is written into our genes, and how we can tackle them. She will also share some tips for presenting clearly and persuasively, focusing on how to put content together. So, um, we have in the room also, you can see Dan, Daniel Neiburn, he's the co-founder and CEO of Virtual Internships. Hi, Dan, welcome. Hi, Mirta, um, and hi, everybody. Um, and Mirta, thank you for the uh, such a lovely introduction. So uh, I'm Dan, I'm the uh, CEO and co-founder of Virtual Internships. I'm calling everybody today from, from London uh, in the UK. And I'm particularly excited. Normally, Myrta has the honor and privilege of introducing our, our guest speaker, but today I was uh, very excited to do so because Vanessa is a uh, very dear friend of mine of many years. We actually went to university together um, too many years ago for, for me to, uh, to, to mention, but uh, we went to Oxford University together um, at a college called Keeble College in Oxford, um, and we were very close friends then. Uh, and I'm so proud and privileged to have seen Vanessa's career and journey since then. I saw her on uh, BBC and ITV uh, and Reuters and various others. And uh, I thought what an amazing journey she's been on, uh, what amazing career uh, she's had uh, and how it would be fantastic for Vanessa to, uh, to present to all of you guys um, about a very important topic, which is public speaking skills. So I, I don't want to take any more uh, time away from Vanessa. Uh, but just to say, Vanessa, thank you for this. Uh, it's uh, again, as I said, it's really uh, an honor and a privilege to be able to hand over to a, a dear old friend of mine um, and uh, very excited to hear more. So hope everybody enjoys the talk and um, yeah, look forward to hearing more. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you, Dan. It's a complete pleasure to be here. As Dan said, we're friends who go way back too long. And you know, the when we met each other, we were the same age as a lot of you people on this webinar. And I know through your brilliant organization, Dan, virtual internships, people are making those connections, whether in person or virtually, and those connections and those contacts and those networks will go with you for years into your career. So really nurture that, really um, you know, nurture those friendships that you're making through this because they will last years. And it's an exciting um, network that you're making here. So as Mr. and Dan talked about, I'm here to talk to you today about how you can boost your confidence for a work presentation. And what I know for sure is that when you get into the workplace, at some point you are gonna be asked to present something. And 
It may be that you're asked to present a lot. It may be that you're asked to present a little, but you are gonna be having to speak in public, whether that's in formal presentations, whether it's in meetings. If there is one single message that I want you to take away from this webinar today, it is this, that anyone can speak confidently and clearly. Doesn't matter where you come from, doesn't matter how experienced you are, doesn't matter if you're an introvert, doesn't matter if right now the thought of having to do that fills you with dread, anyone can speak confidently and clearly. And I want you to take that message to your heart. How do I know? Well, because as Meitha has told you, I've had a career as a news anchor and I've also helped hundreds of people now do this very thing. When I was working as a news anchor, as you know, I've done that for a number of organizations and I've been doing it for a number of years when suddenly I was overtaken by stage fright. And stage fright, if you haven't heard that phrase, is when you start to get really, really fearful about speaking in public. In my case, it happened quite quickly. It came on quite suddenly when I was doing an important interview with a well-known politician and I choked, I literally choked and coughed on air and I couldn't carry on speaking. And my co-presenter had to take over and I felt awful about it. And I thought, gosh, this might happen again. And it really became something that started to worry me and I would feel very panicked every night before I went on air, which was quite awkward because I had my own program at that point and I was presenting in front of hundreds of thousands of people every night and hating it and terrified. During that time, I really decided I've got to get over this because if I want to keep on with this career I've got to find ways to deal with it and put those fears in perspective which thankfully I managed to do but while I was on that journey putting together the toolkit that ultimately helped me what I realized was that I wasn't unusual most people actually don't love speaking in front of big audiences in fact Studies show that between 50 and 70% of people don't love speaking in front of audiences. Now, for some people, that's just, they don't like it very much and um, they get a little bit nervous. For others, that means that they will do anything they can to avoid it. I've even had clients who have engineered minor car crashes to avoid having to present at work. That's how fearful they were of it, that they'd rather have a car crash than speak in front of an audience. So if you're sitting there and you're thinking, gosh, one of the things I'm not looking forward to when I get into the workplace is having to speak in public, then know that you are normal. You're in the majority, anywhere between 50 and 70% of people don't like that very much. And the thing that people tend to fear is those symptoms of nerves. So you may have had this yourself at some point that you felt your hands go sweaty or your heart race or you've gone red or your mind's gone blank and you've forgotten what to say. You might worry that you might say something wrong, that you might not have the answer to a question. We tend to worry about those uncomfortable feelings. But if you change your thoughts about what presenting means, then you can change your feelings and you won't feel those horrible, uncomfortable, nervous symptoms. So that's where I want to start with this presentation, just explaining to you a little bit about why you feel nervous when you speak in public and then take you through an exercise about how you can dial down those nerves and minimize them. You may have heard about the fight or flight response and the fight or flight response is a response that we all have to events that seem dangerous. So when something happens, when an event happens that seems dangerous, we will think it's dangerous. We'll have a thought about that. And that thought then will translate very quickly to a feeling. So our heart might start to race and that will then translate very quickly to a behavior. So we, we might run away. This fight or flight response was passed down to us by our ancestors who evolved all those hundreds of thousands of years ago. And so let's say, for example, one of our ancestors heard a rustle in the bushes, which is what that picture on the left is meant to signify. If they heard a rustle in the bushes, they would have a thought about that. And they would think to themselves, there's a saber toothed tiger in the bushes. And that thought would make them feel something frightened. And that fear would make them behave in a certain way. So they might run away from that saber toothed tiger, or they might fight that saber toothed tiger. Now, the thing is that very often when they heard a rustle in the bushes, there was no saber-toothed tiger there. But 
the ones who survived, our ancestors who survived were the ones who overestimated the disaster and did behave as if that saber-toothed tiger was there. Because occasionally there was a saber-toothed tiger there. So they were the ones who survived. And this has happened over millennia and it's been passed down to us, this fight or flight response. Now, when our ancestors were evolving all those thousands of years ago, they were evolving on the African savannas. And at some point the environment changed and our ancestors went from swinging through trees in a very heavily forested environment to a savanna environment like this, the one that you can see in this picture. And what that meant was that our ancestors were much more exposed to predators because they were no longer protected by the trees. And around about that time, anthropologists tell us that our ancestors had to start to cooperate and work in groups to protect themselves from those predators. And so our ancestors thrived at a time when to be safe, they needed to belong to their social group. Those who were excluded from the social group were then left to battle the elements and to fight those predators on their own. So really to be excluded from your social group in those days was potentially a death sentence. And so our ancestors who feared being excluded from their social group were the ones who survived and they've passed that on to us in our genes too. And we continue therefore to fight, flee or freeze in the face of social exclusion. Where does public speaking come into this? Well, when you put yourself out there in front of an audience, you risk social exclusion. You risk being judged negatively. It may not be very likely, but it feels likely to us because just like our ancestors who overestimated the fact that that saber toothed tiger might be in the bushes, we overestimate the disaster that might happen if we're excluded from our social group. We underestimate our ability to cope. That's been passed down to us. So if you are one of the 50 to 70% who feels afraid having to speak up in front of an audience, just know that you're doing this. You're overestimating the disaster. You're underestimating your ability to cope. And that's a gift that was handed down to you by your ancestors but it doesn't always feel very comfortable. And we want to put that in perspective. So the first exercise that I'd like to take you through is exactly that. We're gonna put those thoughts, those uncomfortable thoughts about speaking in perspective. I would love you to do this with me because I'm gonna take you through this exercise now. And I'd love you to get a blank piece of paper. And I would love you to, if you've got an A4 piece of paper there, just turn it on its side like that. And I want you to create six columns. So how many lines is that? That's five lines down the page, isn't it? To create six columns, just equal sized columns. I'm gonna take you through this exercise, as I say, and we're gonna go through it fairly quickly. But if this is something you struggle with, I would love for you to revisit this and do it more thoroughly. Take an hour over it so that you can really start to put some of those thoughts and fears in perspective. But we're gonna do it quite quickly now so you can just see how it works. So assuming that you've all got pen and paper to hand and you've drawn your six columns, the first thing I want you to do in that first column on the left-hand side, the first column you see on your page, is write down the first thing that comes to mind about public speaking. What is it that makes you uncomfortable? What is it that you fear? If I said to you, right, right now, you've got to go and speak to a hundred important people who um, you know, might have some say over your career and you've got to present something to them. What's the thought that comes into your mind? It might be that you worry that your mind would go blank. It might be that you worry that they'd see you looking visibly nervous. It might be that you think, I wouldn't know an answer to a question. What are those things that first pop up for you? And as I said, when you're doing this yourself afterwards, I'd like you to be really thorough about this and write a list of all the things that come to mind. Right now, because we're doing this quickly, just write down the first one, the worst one that comes to your mind. So let's say, for example, that you're worried that your mind might go blank and you'll forget what to say. Let's say that that's your worst fear. Write that down in that column. When you've done that, I'd like you to then think, well, what is it about that fear 
that concerns me? What's the consequence that I think might happen? Because usually it's not the first thing that we think that is truly our main fear. Usually we're worried about the consequence that that would lead to. So for example, you might think if my mind goes blank, if I look nervous, if I can't handle a question, then people will judge me negatively. I won't be seen as credible. It will affect my career. It will limit me in some way. Usually that's the, the real reason that sits under that superficial fear that you have. So again, I'd just like you to ask that question, that first fear that popped up for you, if you worry that you wouldn't be able to answer a question, why does that worry you? What's the consequence that you're truly worried about? Just give you a moment to do that while I have a sip of water. Okay, the next thing we're gonna do then is go to column two. And in column two, I'd like you to ask yourself, how much do you fear that this thing that you've written down might happen? So if you've written several things in that list, I want you to put a number on each of those fears, how likely it feels out of 100 as a percentage, just top of the head. You don't have to do any maths here. Just get a feeling for it. How likely, how big does this feel for you, this worry that you have about your mind going blank? How likely does that feel to happen? Just write the first number that comes to your mind. We don't have to be very scientific. In your third column then, this is the column that we call the healthy adult voice. Because if you imagine that first column that we wrote all our fears in, that's our primitive head there. That's our emotional, irrational, spontaneous brain thinking. That's the brain that our ancestors handed down to us. But we want to bring our rational, modern, human, healthy adult voice on this and bring that brain to bear. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at those fears in the first column and ask yourself, what might be unlikely about this? Why might this not happen? What might not be true about this? For some people, it helps to imagine that they're talking to a friend. So if a friend came to you and said, I'm really worried about this speaking situation. I think my mind might go blank. I think I'm gonna lose my job as a result. What would you say to them to make them feel better about that? How would you bring rationality to bear? So you might say to them, well, first of all, how many times have you spoken in public and how often has that not happened? You might um, point out to them that actually lots of people struggle with public speaking. And so your audience is unlikely to judge you badly because in most cases, they themselves will have struggled with this. These are the kinds of answers I'd like you to give yourself. It can really help when you're doing this exercise at a future date to just step away for a moment after you've written your fears down, go for a walk around the block, have a coffee and come back with a different frame of mind. One of the things you've got to be aware of when you're doing this exercise, when you're completing that healthy adult column is about thinking filters. Thinking filters, if you haven't heard of them, are cognitive distortions, faulty thought patterns that lead to level, higher levels of anxiety. So these are patterns of thinking that we've got into that undermine our confidence. And here are some examples of thinking filters. So for example, labeling, what is labeling? Well, if you are someone who does badly in an exam, are you someone who's able to say that exam went badly or do you label yourself as someone who can't do exams? That's what labeling is when you use one event and from that you make a meaning that this means something about you and you put a label on yourself. It's similar to all or nothing thinking. That's another thinking filter. If something goes wrong, do you, if, if for example, you're giving a presentation and most of it goes right, but you forget one thing, are you someone who thinks, oh, that went well, and there was one little thing I could improve? Or if one little thing goes wrong, are you the kind of person who goes, that ruined it, that presentation went terribly? That's all or nothing thinking, yeah? Um, are you someone emotional reasoning for example if you look at your audience and someone looks a bit bored in the audience do you take that to mean that you're boring for example so these are all examples of 
thinking filters. I won't go into all of them, but if you're interested, you can have a look at um, what some of these thinking filters mean. But what I want you to be aware of when you're doing this column here is that you will have thinking filters. You will have patterns of thinking about yourself that you're very used to. And I just want you to question, am I really being rational about this? So have an awareness of those thinking filters while you're doing that exercise. Okay, so once you've filled in that healthy adult column and you've given an answer to all of those fears that you wrote down in column one, we're then gonna write in the fourth column, we're gonna create a coping strategy. So let's just imagine now that that fear that you wrote down in column one should happen. If it did happen in the unlikely, very unlikely event that it did happen, what would you do about it? How would you cope with it? If, for example, you couldn't answer a question, how would you cope in that moment? You might, for example, say to your audience, I'm sorry, I don't know that answer at the moment. I'm going to find out and get back to you. If you have a mind blank, you might say to your audience, I've just forgotten what I was about to say. Can someone help me out here? Can someone remind me where I was? So what would you do in that situation if the worst happened? And remember, it's unlikely. We always overestimate that. But if it were to happen, how could you cope with it? I'll just give you a moment to have a think about that. Again, when you come to do this at a later date, if you want to, you're gonna do a coping strategy for each of those fears. And then finally, in our last column, our prevention plan column, we're gonna say, okay, well, how could we prevent that thing from happening? If you're worried that you might have a mind blank, what could you do before the event to prepare for it, to prevent it. You might wanna take in a few notes. You might want to simplify your message so that it's easier for you to remember because very often I find speakers are trying to say too much and they can't keep it all in their head. So if you're worried that you might go red, this is something that used to happen to me on television. I get a horrible red chest when I was nervous. My prevention plan was literally using some makeup on it. What are the things that you could do beforehand to prevent that horrible thing that you're worried about from happening? Again, when you come to do this, go through each of the fears that you've had and create your prevention plan. And then when you've done all this, we're going to revisit those numbers again and just top of the head, put a percentage on how likely you think that fear is to happen now. How worrying does that feel for you now? And what I hope will happen is having gone through the healthy adult column, the coping strategy, the prevention plan, that that number you wrote in column two will have come down. If it felt like an 80% fear, a few minutes ago, hopefully it's now come down to a 20 or a 30 and it feels more manageable. So obviously we've gone through this very quickly. And if you're someone who's struggled with speaking fears for a long time, this is something that you're gonna to wanna to go through slowly and you're gonna to want to revisit and keep it close to you before you go and speak so that you can remind yourself. But this will work. If you do this, this will work. Why does it work? Well, number one, it helps you see the flaws in your thinking. It helps you get out of that primitive brain, that pattern of thinking that you may have been in for a long time, and it enables you to see a different perspective. But also importantly, it means that by doing this now, before you have to speak, then you're going to have an answer ready when you need it. When you're in that moment, you're about to go on stage or you're about to speak up in your meeting and you have that thought, oh, I'm worried my face will go red and everyone will see I'm nervous. You don't have to start reassuring yourself in that moment because you'll have the answer there. You'll have already done this thinking. So that's why it's important to do it now. OK, so that's the first exercise that I wanted to take you through to help change the perspective in your thoughts. When I work with people, I work with them over a number of weeks and we do a lot of work on their mindset and their confidence and their belief in their, themselves. So there's that mindset component of confident presenting. But the other thing that we look at is the method. How can they actually speak really well? And so the next exercise that I want to go through with you is about presenting method, because as I said, you will be asked to do this at some point at work. And actually, what I find is that in so many industries, people just expect you to be able to do this and companies often don't really invest in showing you how to do it. So this is one of the reasons why doing the internship that you're doing here with virtual internships is so useful because you're getting exposure to these things that were you to go straight into the workplace, you probably wouldn't have this training necessarily. 
somehow you're just expected to be able to do this, but actually this is a learned skill like any other. So that's the other part of learning to speak confidently and clearly you've got to have a really great method. Now, the main mistake that I see when people present in terms of their content is that they have no clear message. They themselves don't know what they really want to say. And also they're sharing too much information. And we human beings are very bad at taking in lots of information when it's spoken. We're much better at taking in information if it's written. If we're being spoken to, there's only so much we can take in. And in my view, presenting is an opportunity not just to dump information on people, but really to change their perspective, transform their thinking, show leadership rather than just inform. If you want to inform people, send them an email. That's all you need to do. So I want to you know, just make you aware that if you have a clear message and if you are really careful about how much information you're giving, you'll already be far ahead of most of the presenters that you'll see in your working life. Now, it's all very well and good to say, be clear and don't give too much information, but how do you actually go about doing that thing? Well, as soon as you're asked to give a presentation, the very first thing I want you to do is to summarize your idea, summarize your presentation in a single sentence, just one sentence. Now you might be thinking, I can't do that. There's far too much I'd want to say in a presentation to be able to summarize it in a single sentence. But this is where my journalism training is gonna come in because if you look at any news website, any newspaper, you will see that they're telling lots of stories, but each of those stories is summarized in a headline, in a single sentence. This is the BBC News website from a few days ago. So I know a lot of you are in Saudi Arabia and all over the world, but this is the stuff that's bothering us in the UK at the moment where I am. At the moment, you can see our Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, wearing the face mask there in the middle. He's been having parties while the rest of us in the country were not because of COVID. So we were all locked in our houses and the allegation is that he's been having parties. He's had to apologise to the Queen about it. So that headline there says number 10, which is... The, his, the seat of power for our prime minister, it's where he lives. Number 10 apologizes to the queen over lockdown parties. Does that tell the whole story? Of course not. But does it tell us what that story is about? Yes, it does. We understand enough from that headline that we know, do we want to click on that story and carry on finding out more? And it's the same with all of these stories here. Just from reading that headline, we know what they're about, even if we don't know the whole story. So that's what I want you to do when you sit down to prepare your presentation is put a headline on it, really get that clarity. What is this about? If I could only tell my audience one thing, what is that sentence that I would say to them? And that's going to be the key pillar, if you like, the key foundation of your presentation. So that's the first thing that we need. We need a key message when you prepare your presentation. Now, much like those stories on the BBC News website, you can't just have a headline. You've got to have some substance to what you're saying as well. But we don't want to give too much information. So we need to limit ourselves in some way because all of us, when we're close to our subject, when we know a lot about it, we tend to say too much about it. And we tend to assume that other people are as interested or as knowledgeable as we are. And so we tell them too much and we tell them um, often we pitch it at the wrong level, we make it too complicated. So what we're going to do is limit ourselves and we are only going to allow ourselves to say three things, three key things that support that message, that headline that you want to give. Using that example of Boris Johnson, our Prime Minister, apologising to the Queen, what might we want to say about that story? What would be the three key messages we might want to say? Well, our first pillar might be what happened, where the parties happened, how many parties there were, what the rules were at the time, what the Queen said about it. So we might want to break that up further into three sub themes, three key points of supporting evidence for that first theme. So that would be the kind of what happened, what the rules were at the time. Then that middle theme might be the story of what happened today, how Boris Johnson, our Prime Minister, apologised to the Queen, what she said said about it. That could be our middle pillar of information, supporting evidence. And then you might want a third pillar of supporting evidence that would be about 
people's reaction to this story, what voters were saying, what other politicians were saying, what the newspapers were saying. So if you had those three things, what happened, where the party happened, the, the facts of the event, what's happened today with the apology and people's reaction to it, that would give you a solid support for that key message. You'd be giving enough supporting evidence, but not too much. The other thing that I truly, truly believe about presentation, as well as it's not about information, is that it is about getting action from your audience. So if you're speaking to someone, you want them to do something different. You want to get a change. And if you're not asking your audience to do something, then in my view, you're wasting an opportunity. So we always want a call to action at the end of our presentation. What do you want your audience to do as a result of hearing you speak? When you get into the workplace, you will have performance reviews, six monthly or yearly, and you'll have goals set for you. And very often those goals will be made SMART. There's an acronym SMART that stands for Specific, Measurable, Achievable, Relevant, Time Bound. So your boss will, together with, with you know, in conversation with you, set you a specific goal for the next six months. Um, they'll make that goal measurable so you can know, have you done it, have you achieved it or have you not? Um, they'll make it achievable. They won't make it too hard for you, it'll be doable. They'll make it relevant to your job and they'll also make it time bound. So you'll have to have achieved this goal within a certain time. That's a smart goal. And you want to make your calls to action for your audience smart too. If we say to them, get behind our idea, that's not smart. One person's idea of getting behind an idea is very different to someone else's. So we want to make that call to action smart. Okay, so we've got the key pieces now of our presentation. You've got your key message, you've got your supporting evidence. You may break that, break that up into three smaller points, but no more than three. Three is the magic number when it comes to communication. We remember things in threes. And then finally, you're gonna have your call to action. Now, there's something else really important that we need, and that is stories. So we love stories. Human beings love stories. We remember things in stories. Often when you're presenting in a work environment, you're presenting about abstract ideas or data, and we don't remember abstract ideas. So you'll want to be telling stories to bring those ideas to life, bring that data to life. I've worked a lot in the pharmaceutical industry where they're talking about scientific experiments and how one drug compares with another. But what really brings that presentation of data to life is stories, how patients benefit. And that's when we really remember those stories. So you too want to use stories in your presenting. Okay, you've now got it. You've got all the parts that you need to create your presentation. So how might this work in real life? Well, it might surprise you to learn that I've been using this today in delivering this presentation. So let me show you what we did. The first thing I started with was by telling you that key message, which I said I wanted you to take to your heart that anyone can speak confidently and clearly. I then brought out some supporting evidence for that. Bear with me, there we are. So I then started to talk about why we feel nervous. Do you remember we started there? Then we talked about how to put your fears in perspective. We did that exercise about pinning down your fears and um, answering them and creating the coping strategy. And then I talked about how to build presentation content, which is what we're talking about at the moment. If we look a bit more closely at how I subdivided that, that first theme, why we feel nervous, First of all, if you look over here on the left of the slide, you can see my three sub themes. I talked about how common it was for people to feel nervous. I put it in that historical context. I talked to you about our ancestors and I explained that we're doing what they did, overestimating the disaster, underestimating our ability to cope. Then I went on to tell you about how to put your fears in perspective. So we talked about thinking filters. We went through that exercise and then I explained to you why that exercise works. Then I went on to tell you about how to build presentation content. I talked to you about the mistakes that I see people make. I explained this temple process. And then I gave you an example, which is the thing I'm doing now. This is very meta, isn't it? I'm explaining to you the example of how my presentation is working. We're missing 
the call to action. So here it is, guys. This is the call to action. Next time you present, I want you, number one, first of all, to do that exercise where you put your fears in perspective. I can share these slides with you, Mirta, so you can share them with people, or of course you can refer back to this recording. But I want you to go through that process where you put those fears in perspective, answer yourself with that healthy adult voice, create your coping strategy and your prevention plan. And then the second thing that I want you to do when you get into the workplace, when you are first asked to present, don't panic. You're gonna just structure your talk like a temple, like I've shown you how to do. Because what I can tell you, is that this is a learned skill like any other. No one's born speaking at all. No one's born speaking brilliantly, certainly. It's something that you learn through life and you can learn it too. Anyone can put this into practice. Anyone can speak confidently and clearly. And I hope that this little example has given you confidence that you can do that. If you're someone who thinks I want more help with this because this is something that's a real struggle, then I'd be very happy to speak with you. You've got my email address there at the top, www.vanessacuddiford.com. No, that's my website, sorry. My email address is vanessa at vanessacuddiford.com and reach out to me and I'm happy to have a chat with you um, because there are so many things that we can do to make you feel confident so that when you arrive in that workplace, speaking is just the thing that enables you to thrive rather than the thing that holds you back. I hope that's been helpful. I'd be really happy now to take any questions that people yes, have. Yes, thank you, Vanessa. That was super, super interesting and super helpful. And people have been following up your presentation, commenting on the chat and sharing how they also, we all feel nervous at some point. And so we have some questions here and someone is asking, is training before the presentation the best way to make a presentation successful or are there any other tips better ways that you can share with us how we can prepare ourselves and yeah tackle these nerves well the two things that i've shared with you today i think are fundamental so get your head right and get your process right obviously there's a lot more that you can learn i would really recommend that you do practice particularly um if you're not used to doing this. I mean, I did a run through this morning on my own, on myself, just to time it, to make sure that the tech was working, to make sure that I knew which order I wanted to say the words in. I didn't learn it. I would never recommend that you learn a presentation because if you forget a little bit of it, then it's very easy for that to wrong foot you. And you know, now you're lost if you can't remember a word. Plus, then the strain is kind of visible to everyone as you're trying to remember your words because that's not the way we speak. You know, when you speak, you're not thinking about the words that you're choosing or trying to recall words. You're just, you've got an idea and you're talking about it. So we want to mimic that in our presenting, but we want to be really clear on what those key points are. And that's the temple process that I shared with you. If you're very clear on those key points that you want to hit, if you've got rid of all the extra information that you don't need and you've really kept just those points that you really do need, then it will be easy for you to hold in your brain. But certainly practice saying it out loud um, just so that you get comfortable before you do it. Um, of course, you know, sometimes you're going to be giving really big, probably later in your careers, really big set piece presentations. Some of you might go on to do a TED talk, for example. You might go on to address the UN. You might go on to, um, you know, become president of the USA and have to give your inaugural speech. And for those occasions, you are going to want to really learn it and have it absolutely word perfect. But that's a process that takes a long time. So for day to day presenting, in the workplace, it's not sustainable to do that. You know, I've worked with people who've delivered those kinds of talks and we will work for weeks on it and they will absolutely be saying those words in their sleep. Day to day, of course, you can't do that. So in answer to your question, what can you do to prepare? The two things that I've shared with you, I think, you know, are your starting point, but then do practice saying it out loud. And if you can get someone to watch you, that's a really good test because as I said, very often we're so close to our subject that we don't kind of realize that we're using jargon, words that only we know in our little um, environment, in our work environment, or we might be going into too much detail, or we might not be explaining key concepts that we understand, but our audience who isn't an expert don't understand. So if you can get someone who's kind of got the same sort of level of understanding as your audience to just hear you do it, then they can point out to you, hmm, I didn't understand that word. 
And that's a useful test as well of your own thinking. Yes, um, you mentioned something interesting that um, someone is asking about. Uh, language and audience, right? Someone is saying, well, I get uh, nervous because uh, sometimes I need to speak with a particular audience and I don't really know how to approach. Um, what can you tell us about how we should speak to different audiences? Well, you're thinking in exactly the right way if you're concerned about that, because what a lot of presenters do is they start from what do I care about? What do I want to tell the audience? And that's the wrong way around. You always want to have your audience in mind first in all the communication that you do. I'll tell you a little story about this. So recently I went to buy a new mattress for my bed. And the reason I went to buy a new mattress was because I had a backache and because my husband tells me that I fidget in bed at night and I wake him up because I shake the mattress. So I went to buy this new mattress and I went into the shop and the man said to me, are you looking for a new mattress? And I said, yes. And he said, great, come and look at this one. It's a vegetarian mattress. It's vegan in fact. Um, it's got no wool in it. It's really easy to recycle. It's a brilliant vegan mattress. And he was telling me all these wonderful things about this vegan mattress. What he hadn't done was found out what his audience was there for. He hadn't said to me, why do you want a new mattress? If he'd asked me that, I'd have told him I've got a bad back and my husband's about to divorce me. And then he still could have sold me the vegan mattress, but he could have sold it to me in terms that I cared about. He could have said, this mattress won't move if you fidget. This mattress is great for your back. And he still could have sold me the vegan mattress that he loved, but he'd have been selling it to me in terms that I care about. He clearly cared about the fact that it was a vegan mattress. I didn't. So it's just a little tiny example for how if you're speaking from the point of view of what you care about, you can totally miss the mark with your audience. And I think really, as long as you're asking that question, as long as your thinking starts with what does my audience care about, then you can't go far wrong. And you can ask other people's opinions. It's really useful to speak to someone first who knows your audience, who might even be in the audience. You know, when I was planning this um, presentation today, I've spoken about this hundreds of times to different audiences, but Mirtha and I still had a conversation where she told me that this was an international audience. She told me the kind of level of experience that you had. So I was able to tailor it both in my language, but also where I was pitching it, because I'm assuming that a lot of people on this call haven't presented before um, and may feel fairly nervous doing it for a first time. So that's where I've pitched it. If I was presenting to people who were, you know, always giving keynote speeches and had 20 years of experience, I'd be pitching it at a, at a different level. So, you know, it's always hard to get into someone else's head. You can't do it but it starts with trying to, asking those questions and thinking, what do they care about? Thank you, yes, absolutely. Putting ourselves in, in, in the place of the other who's actually listening, right? What do they want to, uh, what are they interested in? We have a very, we have many questions that revolve around the same topic and we have um, two specific questions about imposter syndrome. For those who do not know, imposter syndrome is when we feel that we are not enough, when we feel that we what we have is over luck and not because we really uh, did our best and we're all the time feeling we don't deserve something. And of course that undermines our confidence, right? So we have two specific questions about how can I tackle this imposter syndrome that visits me whenever I'm presenting and so how I can get rid of this stress and present uh, confidently? You give us some tips, right? But the audience wants more. What's more? Okay, great. Yeah, great question. And I think every woman, I, I, I work with both men and women, but certainly I don't want to generalize here. It's something that I see pretty much all my female clients struggle with. Some of my male clients do, a number of my male clients do, but I see it more truthfully among women or perhaps they're just more prepared to talk about it. Um, I think it's really important to know that if you feel like that, it's not unusual. And actually, we kind of want that self-awareness. We want you to be questioning yourself because if you look at the people in the world who don't question themselves and who just go in there and think they're doing the right thing without giving that some thought, sometimes they're the people who don't make the best decisions. So your imposter syndrome can be useful because really what is at the heart of it is you're asking, is this right? Am I doing the right thing? Am I making the right call? At some point though, you've got to know, you know, 
I am good enough. And what's the best way to deal with that? Well, simply find the evidence that supports the belief that you're good enough. So you won't be getting to a position in your life unless there's a reason for you to be there. You haven't got onto an internship scheme. You haven't got this internship. You haven't won this job because you're not ready for it. You've got there because you've done well at school, because you've got experience, because you did a great interview, whatever it is, there'll be evidence out there for why you do deserve to be there. And what I see with people is that they kind of go through life subconsciously gathering the evidence that undermines them. So they'll do a presentation, for example, and it will go 90% well, but they'll remember the 10% that, oh, didn't go that well, that one question they couldn't answer, that one person who looked bored. And if we do that repeatedly throughout our lives, then after a while, we're just building all this evidence and gathering all these examples of when we're failing. But if you look every day, you are succeeding in what you're doing. And I would wager that you're doing far more good. You're succeeding far more of the time than you're failing. But we tend to just take that for granted. We just think, well, that's what I should be doing. So I'd encourage you to just daily take a couple of minutes and just gather the evidence for where you've done well that day. It doesn't need to be major wins, but it might just be, I sent that email and I wrote it really well. I had a great conversation with my manager. I you know, went for a run and did some exercise, whatever these things are, just gather the evidence for where you're succeeding and really exercise that muscle that builds you up rather than the one that that tears you down. But know that this is the human condition you're talking about here. You know, haven't we all felt like this for hundreds of years? And actually to have that self-awareness is also um, a strength, really, because you do want to be questioning and asking, am I doing the right thing? but then kind of putting it in perspective. If it's something you over worry about, use that exercise that I shared with you where you put your fears in perspective. I'm worried I don't deserve to be here. Right, what's the truth about that? What might not be true about that? You can still use that exercise for that. But then more generally, every day, just give yourself the gift of a couple of minutes where you just make a note of where you've won that day. And over time, that will start to kind of shift your thinking about yourself. Vanessa, Dan, Dan here. We have lots and lots of questions. Um, uh, and thank you so much. It was super useful. I've done many presentations in my time, but I still picked up a lot of tips in there, um, especially about sometimes trying to say too much. Uh, and sometimes that simple message is, uh, is even better and makes you a little less nervous because you're not trying to cram so much into your mind. But there's a super interesting point that somebody has made in the chat. Um, and we are virtual internships. And of course, with the future of work, we're all working a lot remotely now. Um, and Valentin has made a point about virtual communication, for example, on Zoom. Um, I wonder if you have any, any tips or, or thoughts about that. Uh, Valentin has, uh, has mentioned about looking at the webcam, for example, uh, when you're presenting or trying to, to improve your eye contact with it, something which I, I think is super interesting. Um, I'm not sure I do myself. So any, any thoughts or tips on um, presentation or public speaking in a virtual setting? Yeah, I mean, this is so relevant, isn't it, at the moment? And you're absolutely right, Valentine. What we tend to do on Zoom calls is do all this, don't we? We look at the people who are on the call when really we want to be looking at that camera and that can feel quite uncomfortable if you're not used to doing it. So number one, look people in the eye or in the camera, I should say. Um, but I think there's a lot to be said for kind of setting the tone in the first instance. So I'm a big fan, if you can, if it's not too big a meeting, of just framing the interaction from the start and saying, everyone, can you put your cameras on? Because it's very tempting, isn't it? If you're, you know, some of you may be doing it right now, I hope you're not, but half on Facebook, half texting, half doing whatever, you know, stretches or whatever, and only half listening. Whereas if you've got your camera on, then you know people have to be on their game a little bit more and they have to be listening. If you are on camera, then be an active listener. You know, imagine that you're one of those um, actors on stage. You haven't got a speaking part, but you are one of the actors in the background. And that's sort of what you are on a, a meeting like this. You need to be active listening and not kind of, you know, doing one of these. So you're on show when you're on one of those calls. It's more important than ever when we're on Zoom meetings to have really good meeting discipline. So 
you've organized this brilliantly here. Mirta and Dan, you're fielding the questions. It's not a free for all. People can't turn their mics on and interrupt. And you've managed this really, really well. A lot of meetings aren't well managed online. People don't get opportunities to speak. You want a chairperson who's inviting people in and giving people their airtime. So it's important to kind of set out the rules of engagement early on, asking people to have their camera on telling them how they need to behave in that meeting that's really important but other than that i would say that you know you need to be well lit one of the things that i've seen on television over and over again in the pandemic because obviously we've had a lot of television interviews that have happened on zoom is that people will have their laptop kind of somewhere down here so they've got this horrible up the nose shot which is horribly unflattering and lots of head room, you know, they might be absolutely sort of tiny in the shot. And then that doesn't make the best of the person. You look small, you don't have much presence. So really, we want to be, you know, have a nice, um, not, not too much headroom to be well lit. Ideally, you want your camera at eye level or just slightly above like mine is now. So it's slightly looking down on me. That's the most flattering. And you want to ensure that you've got clear rules of engagement. But in terms of the kind of content, all communication benefits from simplicity. That's something that I think you've kind of learned from me today if you didn't already know it. And it is that bit more tiring watching people on Zoom. You don't have that personal thing going on. So more than ever, make sure it's really, really tight and simple. And people will always thank you if you underrun than overrun. So that is an absolute golden rule. Don't overrun. Um, keep it nice and tight. Thank you. And we have so many questions. I'm going to pick just uh, some because we are getting to the end of our very interesting webinar. So let's say I've practiced, I prepared, and I'm still with, I still feel nervous, right? Should I say this to my audience? Like, hey guys, sorry, I'm a little bit nervous, or should I just pretend not to, you know, show my nerves? Uh, how do you advise us on us? And on a second, same line, what happens if in the middle of the presentation I go blank, right? And, and then I forget everything I needed to say. How can I resolve that? Yes. So I'll start with your second one first, which if you're using the temple template, that's less likely to happen because you will just be limiting how much you're allowing yourself to say, and it will be easier to remember it. Always have it somewhere, always have it written down. I have had some horrible experiences as a TV news reporter when I have forgotten what to say. And, you know, I very quickly learned to have something at my feet that in an emergency, I could just pick it up, you know, and have those bullet points, not the whole thing written out, but those key pillars, as I was talking about, your key message, have those somewhere so that you won't go totally blank. As to your question about how much you kind of confess, um, I think that it's always better to just be honest, because if you're trying to cover something up and it's obvious to the audience, now that's when it can look awkward. So I think you're always better off saying, I've lost my place. Um, I've forgotten you know, the name of such and such. I can't answer that question. I'll get back to you about it. I'm feeling really nervous. Just bear with me, guys. I've never done this before. People will generally be very forgiving and will be on your side. As I said, a lot of people struggle with this, so they get it. You know, they've all been in your shoes at some point, the vast majority of people. That said, what feels awful for you won't be anywhere near as um, obvious for your audience. I remember when I was making my first public speaking course, I dug out lots of um, old footage of me reporting when things had gone wrong to show people this is how you cope when things go wrong. And I remember there were three or four events that really stuck in my mind for having been awful when I felt that I'd lost my way or made a mistake. And I found these bits of footage. And when I watched them back, I couldn't use them because actually you couldn't notice the thing that I thought had gone wrong. I remembered it being far worse than it actually was when I watched it back. And in most cases, if it feels like you've forgotten what to say and that horrible mind blank moment is lasting 30 seconds, it was probably three. So just don't be too quick to jump in and say, sorry, I've messed up, because the chances are most people won't have noticed if it really is that you've completely lost your way and now you know we've had several seconds of silence and you don't know where you're going, then you can confess and ask for some help. And in most cases, people will be really sympathetic and help you out. 
Yes, thank you. Um, well, we have many, many questions. I'm sure I won't be able to ask all of them. I just wanted to make some comments because, well, public speaking is one of the most important, uh, generally communication skills is one of the most important skills for uh, work, right? And actually, uh, we here at Virtual Internships, we work with NACE Competences. NACE is a national um, organization for um, uh, employers and college and graduate college. And they created a list of many, many skills we need for work. But one of them, one of the eight most important ones is communication skills. And when we uh, prepare our um, internships, we really do it from this perspective of how can we do so we can really practice our skills during our internship, right? These very important work skills. And so I'm a coach myself. So some of the people who are in the audience today may meet me at some point for a coaching call. And one uh, really um, useful advice I, I give for um, my coaches is try to, at a certain moment of your internship, create this moment to have a presentation. Right, maybe at the end for your host company supervisor, you can create a nice presentation uh, showing what you did during your internship, saying, hey, you know, this is what I did during my internship. This is uh, the projects I've been working uh, on and these are my results or these are the suggestions I have for your future, right? And this is interesting because it can be something short, let's say three, four, five minutes. And with all the tips you have shared now, we have so many great uh, tools to say, okay, I can now do this presentation and include this tip. So uh, for our audience, I really encourage you to apply everything that Vanessa has been uh, sharing with us today by doing this presentation in front of your host company supervisor. Uh, they will be super happy uh, to give you five minutes to say, hey, you know, this is what uh, I've been working on and I want to to share it. So that's a really interesting piece of advice you can take today and really challenge you to apply everything that Vanessa has shared. Um, and some other thing I, I wanted to mention, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but everything you've been sharing about uh, the uh, Tempo uh, organization, this uh, is Barbara Minto, right? She has a book that is called uh, The Pyramid Principle, right? I'm going to share it with uh, our audience. You can take a look because this is very interesting and useful what Vanessa has shared. So Dan, would you like to make another question before we uh, finish? We could, we could continue uh, speaking questions. hours, right? But unfortunately we have we, to, yeah. Uh, absolutely. We, uh, and I'm sure we've got lots more questions. I'm sure everybody wants to ask them. And Vanessa again is very kindly um, given her uh, website. Uh, and I think we can also share her email address. Uh, and of course, we will also be sending uh, this webinar out and it will be on our YouTube page. So please do keep in, in contact with Vanessa as well. But no other questions from my side other than to say, Vanessa, thank you so much. I think we'll leave the final word to you, Vanessa. Um, but uh, uh, it's, again, as I said, super useful for all of our, our colleagues um, who are embarking on their career um, and uh, presentations will certainly be coming their way during the internship and beyond. And, and these tips are extremely useful. And even for myself, as I said, um, as somebody who's done many presentations, I've learned a lot um, and will be incorporating some of these things myself as well. So um, thank you uh, on behalf of virtual internships. And um, yeah, last, last, last goodbye from you, Vanessa, but thanks very much. Oh, well, such a pleasure, really such a pleasure, Dan. Thank you all for um, you know, hanging in there and for all your questions. I'm sorry I couldn't get through more of them. But as I said, you're very welcome to get in contact. I have a team who I work with. And uh, if you want to get in contact with us, we're very happy to have a conversation with you. and We can talk more specifically about your own particular um, presenting issues and help you out if that's something that you need more of. But really, my final thought is that, you know, you have this amazing opportunity here with virtual internships to try all these things out that you're going to be trying in the real workplace. And I would just echo Mitha's words that, you know, give this a go, give this a go. You can do it. As I said to you, the key message is that anyone can speak confidently. Anyone can speak clearly. It's a learned skill. And this is a golden opportunity that you have here where you've got all the support from this organization, the support from the coaches to help you do this really well. So just go for it because you deserve to be heard. You deserve to speak as much as the next person. So just go for it and enjoy it. 
Thank you very much, Vanessa. It has been a pleasure having you today. Everyone, you can stay in touch uh, by reaching out to Vanessa's uh, website. You can also find her on LinkedIn, and then you can stay connected. So thank you very much, Vanessa, for being here with us, and thank you, everyone. Uh, we will welcome you again in our next webinar and hope you all have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you.